So thank you again for joining us this Friday night. Um, tonight we have a very special guest. We have Dr. Lawrence Niles. Dr. Niles has his PhD from Rutgers University in ecology and evolution. Throughout his four year career, he has led projects recovering bald eagles, protecting the Cape May migratory bird stopover, and the research and conservation of Arctic nesting shorebirds in the Delaware Bay and throughout the Western Hemisphere. In 2006, he started his own company to pursue independent research and management projects of a variety of wildlife species, as well as habitat conservation through planning and restoration. Currently, he is working in the Delaware Bay, Cape Cod, San Francisco Bay, San Francisco Bay, the Canadian Arctic, Northern and Southern Brazil and Chile. He has published extensively in peer reviewed scientific journals and he and his wife Amanda Day were part of the PBS nature documentary, Crash, A Tale of Two Species. Uh, Dr. Niles is presenting from New Jersey tonight and um, just give a warm uh, virtual welcome to Dr. Niles. It's a, it's a treat that we have him here tonight. Um, so without further uh, talk, here's Dr. Niles. Uh, thanks, Kevin. Uh, you can hear me, right? Yep. So uh, it's a pleasure to talk to uh, Wincote Audubon Club. I grew up in Bucks County in Southampton, Warminster. So I'm, my sons went to college in Philadelphia. So um, I know the area uh, like the back of my hand. And so I appreciate talking to you. I talked to Kevin, who has a six month old child. Uh, I have six grandkids that are older than that. So I'm kind of, I'm pleased that, uh, you know, we have basically all the generations caring about Del Delaware Bay. So I'm going <clears> to, <throat> I'm going to talk about the status of red knots and horseshoe crabs. I thought first I would talk about the ecology of horseshoe crabs and their current status. And then I'll, uh, I'll switch over to the red knot ecology and their status. I'm going to close with a uh, sort of reflection on the ecosystem values of crabs and what that means for uh, not just birds, but uh, most species. So the horseshoe crab is, uh, uh, is the largest horseshoe crab population in the world occurs in Delaware Bay. And it, it's always been that. Uh, the, <clears throat> the crabs occur in the eastern, uh, southeastern Asia, and then all along the U.S. Atlantic coast. Uh, most of the Asian populations have been wiped out for various reasons. They, I'll go into some of that later, but it's you know, they're killing them for bait, they're killing them for their blood. Uh, so most of these populations are, are uh, so reduced that they're not, uh, <clears throat> they're no longer functional. And see, this is a typical story for horseshoe crabs. Uh, in Delaware Bay, uh, horseshoe crabs have always been abundant and the populations have, go have gone up and down, <clears throat> excuse me, depending on you know, the uses. So in uh, prior to the development of chemical fertilizers, horseshoe crabs were so abundant that they were using them as fertilizer in farm fields. And so there are millions killed for that reason. And it, see, the idea here is that uh, for the most part, horseshoe crabs have been considered worthless. See, I, I want you to keep that in mind because that's the prevailing sentiment about horseshoe crabs is uh, essentially their lack of commercial value. And so the uses have often been just simply wasteful. And uh, the most wasteful use of horseshoe crabs was for bait. So this is a histogram that shows the harvest of horseshoe crabs uh, from the 70s through uh, to 2006. And, you know, up until about 93 or so, there was a continual use of crabs that was just low level. It was uh, fishers who were using them as bait for minnows or for eels, and they were used as bait. So the crabs were, uh, were bait for bait. 
there was a, a small use uh, at that time for uh, their blood for the biochemical lysate. I'll explain that in a little detail in the next slide. But the point here is that uh, when fisheries started to collapse in New England uh, in about this time, 1992, 93, then New England fishermen started to come down to Delaware Bay to take Hershey crabs for bait because they were catching conch or whelks, the you know species that you hold your hold the shell up to your ear to hear the ocean. They're bottom feeders, and so uh, they were using Hershey crabs as bait for them. And the bait harvest went from you know just a hundred thousand or so to about two point five million uh, in at its peak, and then. They started cutting back the, the harvest, uh, but see, at that point, the damage was done. So the population of horseshoe crabs uh, fell dramatically until there were about uh, a quarter or a third of what there was before uh, over harvest. Hey, Dr. Larry. For another, yes. Um, we're having trouble seeing your uh, PowerPoint. Could you um, possibly hit the slideshow option at the top screen there so we can see the full thing? On the, uh, if you go down again, uh, right, put, what should I do? Put your cursor down um, over one of your pictures real quick, and then if you see the uh, options there next to home, there's a insert, draw, design, transitions, and then slideshow. Oh, yeah, uh, going to the top left there. Top left. Uh, okay, you mean over here? Yeah, yeah. There's one of the options that says slideshow. So if you just click that, that would help us all see better. Uh, see, I'm already in the. You mean to go into the presenter view? There you go. That, okay, good. This Thank might you. Be timed. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, see the the actually the more valuable use of horseshoe crabs is for their blood. Uh, horseshoe crab blood contains a biochemical that's used by pharmaceutical companies to detect contamination in most everything that goes into your body medical. So drugs, uh, implants, anything that goes into your body is tested first with uh, the LAL, the biochemical from horseshoe crab blood uh, to detect biocontaminants. Uh, it's an extraordinarily lucrative uh, product. Like one quart of lysate is valued at $29,000. And we've estimated that one horseshoe crab uh, blood uh, for one year, so they, they bleed them and put them back alive. So one year's blood is worth as much as $350 a year. So whereas the, the fishers were probably getting somewhere around $2 a horseshoe crab, these multinational companies that are bleeding crabs are actually making a lot more and they're doing nothing for conservation. And a, a good expose of this, this um, wasteful use of horseshoe crabs, wasteful in the sense that they're making a lot of money and doing nothing about their conservation. There's an article in a South Carolina newspaper that was just published a few weeks ago. Uh, it's the paper's called The State and the author was Kira Eisner. That's a, a great description of what's going on with the bleeding industry. So, just to give you an idea how much this changed the situation on Delaware Bay, that top video is, uh, it was taken in 1986 in a public television program. And see the crabs were so dense that when one crab came up to lay their eggs, it would always dig up eggs that are already buried. So, it reaches a sort of equilibrium where every crab that comes in, every new crab that comes in is laying eggs in the sand, but the equal number of eggs are going up to the surface until they start building up. You can see here, this 
this crab in the upper video is swimming in horseshoe crab egg. See, when we first dealt with it, uh, we first tried to understand this in the 80s. We thought it was all about the bird. But when I get to the end of this talk, I'll describe that why this is important to uh, the fisheries of Delaware Bay. In fact, the ecology of Delaware Bay was underpinned by the eggs laid by horseshoe crabs. Now, the lower photograph is the way it is now. So if we're lucky, we'll get some eggs on the beach. And this can only last for maybe a, a, a few nights, maybe a week. Whereas this largesse was, uh, once the eggs started to build up, and they would stay on the surface for the entire month. So very different ecological situation. So you could see in the numbers that it, the situation has not improved. So the, the fisheries agencies allowed the crab to be over harvested in the late 90s, early 2000s. They cut them down to about a third of their population and they've stayed there ever since. The, this top graph is the result of a uh, ocean trawl done by Virginia Tech. You can see that the average number of per toe hasn't changed at all in the last uh, 20 years. And this is, we do egg density counts on Delaware Bay beaches. And uh, this number here is what it was in that video, about 45,000 eggs per square meter on the surface. Uh, now we're down about 8,000 eggs per square meter and it's not improving. So the situation was uh, they, they over harvested it and then it's still not fixed. I'm gonna talk about the knots. So uh, all of our work uh, uh, or much of the work that I'll be describing is a result of our uh, project that we carry out every year in Delaware Bay using cannon nets. So we're capturing birds, uh, we're uh, tagging them with uh, unique ID leg flags so that they can be identified in the future with binoculars or spotting scope. And see that data helps us estimate numbers and track movement. But we've uh, also, when, when you have birds in the hand, it allows a lot more so we could take blood, uh, we can do measurements. So a lot of what we know is a consequence of this trapping. We've done it all over the, the hemisphere. And see, more recently, what we've been doing is putting on uh, tracking devices. So we started out with a crude tracking device called a geolocator, which is only about one gram and it can go on the bird's leg, but you have to recapture the geolocator to, to get the data from it. Now we're starting to put on uh, low weight satellite transmitters. And um, so uh, from this data, see, we got a much better idea of what, what the uh, extraordinary uh, migratory journey of the red knot and a lot of other shorebird species. See, we're trying to understand these species. You have to look from the top of the world. So the Arctic is the center. And then there's a different subspecies that migrate. This subspecies migrates all the way down to uh, New Zealand and uh, Western Australia. Uh, this species migrates all the way down to South Africa. And then our subspecies migrates down to Terra del Fuego in Chile. Uh, but there's also smaller wintering numbers in northern Brazil, Venezuela, and then the Caribbean in, in Florida. Now the tracking devices have told us a lot, like not just where they're moving. But for example, this bird uh, in its flight from Lagoa Pesh, uh, southern Brazil to the Delaware Bay, flew seven days straight. So it didn't land, it just kept on flying through the night for seven days. 
And see, that tells the story about these birds and it, it highlights their uh, vulnerability because to do that, they have to pack on a lot of fat. Uh, so a bird will travel 20,000 miles in a year, 10,000 down, 10,000 back to the Arctic. Uh, a, uh, like a bird that arrive in Delaware Bay, uh, typically around 120 grams, but some have come in less than 90 grams. And while they're in Delaware Bay, they'll, we've had birds that have gotten up to 220 grams. So they a dramatic increase in weight. And uh, so that they can then go on to the Arctic and uh, successfully get there, but also they rely on these resources to help them get started there because when they arrive, uh, it's still, um, much of the habitat is still frozen. So they're existing on this spot. I'm gonna show you what it looks like. And this is kind of a gross picture, but you can see how much fat you're putting on. And see, not only are they gaining that fat, they're also reducing the, when they get close to leaving, they reduce the size of their organs of digestion, their stomach, their intestines, and they reduce that down so that they can get even more fat on. So when they're ready to leave, they can barely digest. And see, that happens when they arrive. So when they take off from Southern Brazil, they're in the same condition. They build up weight like this. We've trapped birds in Brazil that were 240 grams. And, uh, and see, they're, 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 they start reducing the size of their stomachs and intestines. So when they get to Delaware Bay, they, they can't eat clams and, and mussels, the things that they normally eat. That's why horseshoe crab eggs are so vital because they're easily digested and they could quickly start on rebuilding weight again so that they can make that final trip to the Arctic. So I wanna go through some of the stopovers because you see the, uh, the migratory stopover for these long distance birds is the most vulnerable habitat. The Arctic is, is uh, the threats in the Arctic are uh, mostly long-term you know, the effects of climate change, but there isn't, there isn't that uh, immediate threat that we have in most of the stopovers. And so I wanna go over that, starting with Delaware Bay. So <clears throat> as I said, uh, the crabs went down, the eggs went down, and then as a consequence of that, the birds went down. So at the, in this graph, you could see that back in the eighties, we had counts as high as 90,000 red knots. And that number fell down to about 15,000 in the mid 2000s. I mean, it was just a tragedy. Uh, all these, it wasn't just knots though, it was ruddy turnstones, it was short-billed dowagers, it was semi-palmated sandpipers, it was sanderlings, dunlin. Like they were all coming into the bay in the same way. They were getting, coming to build up weight so they could go to the Arctic. And see, we pulled the rug out. So now they came and there's lots of birds, but there's not that many eggs. So uh, the 2004 was disastrous. It was birds were going to the Arctic and dying on the way, whether they were getting to the Arctic and dying or they were just failing to breed. And so all those numbers, like we had somewhere in the area of 1.5 million shorebirds at the end of the 90s coming to Delaware Bay. By 2005, it was down to about 300,000. So red knots crashed and all the other species did. They basically came down to the level of horseshoe crab eggs that were existing at that point. And see this, this is a kind of esoteric number, but for us, it's important because it's the percentage of birds we estimate make the weight they need to get to. So they need to get to about 180 grams. And so these dots represent the proportions that get to that. So you could see in 2003, less than 1% of the birds made weight. So that's why we had these big die-offs 
Uh, but now we're only, still only about 35%. So even at that reduced population, only about a third are getting to good weight. Now I'm gonna, so the Berkeley Delaware Bay, they go up to the Arctic, they breed, and then they make their way eventually down to Terra del Fuego, the wintering area. Uh, at, at the, before all these declines, uh, 70, 80 percent of all the red knots were wintering in Terra del Fuego. It's one of those odd ecological uh, 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 puzzles because why would a bird fly from the Arctic all the way down to Terra del Fuego when some of the birds are going to Brazil and to uh, Florida? So why don't they all go to Northern Brazil and, and Florida? And the answer is that they're flying from a place that's disease-free and parasite-free, and they're flying all the way down to a place that is also disease and parasite-free. So they, like birds die on the way to Terra del Fuego, but not as many that die from diseases and parasites when they fly to Northern Brazil and, and other places. Like for example, uh, Florida uh, two years ago had a red tide event that lasted almost the entire time the birds were wintering there. So birds died. And uh, so that's the, the, the strategy, go long distance. So they're going down to uh, Chile. It's right at the very end of the continent. This is Cape Horn right here. And where we were doing, where the birds are wintering, where we were doing the work is in Bay of Lomas. Uh, now, Bay of Lomas is uh, important not only for red knots, but also Hudsonian Godwitch. You can see them also in this photograph. Bay of Lomas is, there's a 30 foot tide, and, uh, but the flat is about five kilometers wide. So basically it's a, it's a place where the tide moves in and out twice a day, but it covers five kilometers of intertidal sand. And so the birds are basically just going in and out with the tide all day, all the time they're wintering. And when so you can see right here, there's a thin line of birds right at the water's edge. Um, and see, uh, birds in the wintering area don't have much of an energy demand. They're not trying to get anywhere. Uh, all they got to do is stay safe from predators. And if their food is consistent, then they don't have to build up weight. So when we catch birds down there, most of them are in about 140 grams. So, you know, far below what we're seeing in the stopovers because they don't need it. The food is secure and, and they got to stay light because there's uh, Aplomato falcons and other birds of prey in the area. But see the, the birds in Chile, also declined. So this this is what uh, clinched the the uh, argument. Like during the mid 2000s, we were battling with uh, almost all the agencies because nobody wanted to recognize this calamity. And eventually, uh, you know, the numbers bore us out. There is no problems in Terra del Fuego, uh, and so, but yet they still declined. Uh, the numbers went from about 56,000 down to a low of about 10,000. But Hudsonian Godwitch didn't, they don't go to Delaware Bay and they didn't decline. So that's why we knew that this was about Delaware Bay. Now, so the birds, you know, go from the Arctic down to Terra Fuego to winter. Now they're moving back up the South American coast eventually getting to another major stopover called uh, Lagoa de Pesh. It's in Southern Brazil, right near the border with um, Uruguay. And so this is uh, here, they're not feeding on horseshoe crab eggs, they're feeding on small clams, but because they're in the South American fall or you know, late summer, uh, the clams are abundant. So they can just go to a place and just uh, with very little hunting, they can just gorge on clams. And so 
they're building up weight, getting ready to go to Delaware Bay. Now, the place is a national park, we go to Pesh National Park, and there are a lot of threats here. Uh, there, the Bolsonaro government, pre the, the president of Brazil is, uh, has, is trying to take away the national park designation. He replaced the park superintendent with a person that is against the protection of the resources in the park. There's all around this place, like you would think that this is rural, and, you know, you're going to see uh, sort of very rudimentary agriculture, but you would be wrong because the agriculture here is more mechanized than here. Giant, John Deere tractors and chemicals. And, you know, so uh, there's that threat, the, the uh, contamination to the, to the uh, intertidal waters. Uh, but there's a lot of other threats. I mean, there's uh, the fishers uh, are uh, fishing the lagoon, but to get there, they have to travel uh, 10 kilometers down the beach that's vital to the red knots and you know they're just speeding up and down chasing birds and but see and see these birds here are I mean we were amazed how big they were they were just super fat and uh, but there's something else going on because when we were there we found birds dying like just flopping around on the beach uh, we, we we took some to uh, Brazilian labs, we still haven't figured out what's wrong, but um, that, uh, whatever's happening there is debilitating the birds to the point where scavengers like caracaras are, are killing you. So there's a lot going on here. We're, we're carrying out a project with partners in Brazil and gradually building up emphasis on this area. We're actually linking it with Delaware Bay, sort of a sister stopover, and where uh, the resources that we are able to develop on Delaware Bay fund, we're sharing with the biologists in Brazil. So now they're working, over, they leave uh, Lagoda Pesh, they go to Delaware Bay, they go up to the Arctic, now they're coming back down. And this is the Atlantic coast, stopovers in New Jersey and Cape Cod. And here, the stopovers are just, I mean, this is wacky. The, the, uh, um, the birds are coming through in mid-July and August. So this is coastal New Jersey that they're trying to find, they're trying to do the same thing they're doing in Lego to Pest. They're trying to find dense clams where they can build weight so that they can then make the the ocean flight down to South America, and uh, the beaches are just filled with people. I mean, this, this I took this picture, and it was on a shoal in Stone Harbor. This is a shoal now, so it goes under it at low tide, at high tide. And uh, somebody had planted a Trump flag on the shoal. I mean, that's how many people there were on this place. But what's interesting about the, the Atlantic Coast southbound stopovers is that you can discriminate the two groups of birds because the, the, the birds that are wintering in South Carolina or in Florida and Caribbean, the sh we call them the short distance migrants, don't molt or, or they, they molt their flight feathers in the stopover. So uh, when you see like this bird on the lower right here, um, all right. You can see how worn its flight feathers are. Those birds won't molt their flight feathers until they get down to Terra del Fuego. So, uh, but the birds that are uh, that are wintering in Florida and Caribbean start their molt, and they don't uh, leave the stopover like Stone Harbor or Cape Cod. They don't leave it until the molt is done, and that's usually in in uh, November. So the long distance birds though are gaining weight and they're trying to get out of there before the raptor migration starts. So you can see the strategy here. The long distance birds are gaining weight. They're trying to get out by the end of August so that they could be, uh, you know, they're heavy with fat. They got to get out before peregrines and coopers and 
sharp shins and all the rest start coming through. Whereas the short distance migrants are following another strategy. They're just waiting until the raptor migration is over and then they migrate out. Now, this other picture is a juvenile. And, uh, I, for people who catch birds, molt is a big deal. And uh, so here you can tell the difference between, you can see uh, what a juvenile looks like. You can see the subterminal bands here on the wing coverts. And see how fresh these primaries are compared to an old adult. So you can also distinguish juveniles in the southbound stopover, which helps us understand about productivity in the Arctic. Now, this past year, we were collaborating with the Fish and Wildlife Service and a wind uh, power company to put on uh, satellite transmitters on red knots. And, um, uh, and so this is one of the results. This is an amazing technology. It's, so instead of, you know, very coarse locations that are, uh, you know, you're only going to, with the geolocators, you have to recapture the geolocator to download data. So you know, the data could be a year or two old. This data is real time. So you can actually track the bird as it's moving down to its wintering areas. So we're uh, going to do a lot more of this this year. We're putting on satellite transmitters in Delaware Bay on the northbound, and we have funding to put transmitters on birds in the southbound. This is, let me just skip that. So now I wanna to get to this sort of ecosystem benefit of horseshoe crabs. See, all the time that we've been playing out this conservation battle, it's been about horseshoe crabs and birds because the agencies aren't, don't, they, they don't, they, they, they essentially saw the horseshoe crab as worthless to them. So the fisheries agency, they care about the product that they can sell, you know, flesh, wheat fish, stripers, flounder, whatever. Horseshoe crabs had none of that. And so they just allowed it to be over harvested. But see, this is the way they treat a lot of the, basic productivity of marine estuaries. So, uh, you know, herring are treated the same way. Manhattan are treated that way. Uh, the, the eels, like all of the fish that fish eat are not being protected. And so what we saw as a sort of bird crab issue was really a window into our dysfunctional fishery system. So uh, first of all, you got the eggs, right? So all the eggs that you saw in that previous video, that most of those eggs are going into the sea. But see, the eggs that don't go into the sea eventually hatch. And see, this is the small crab hatching. And see, they're coming out into this intertidal uh, shoreline. And you can see the minnows, see the minnows? See, they're coming in and eating those young horseshoe crabs. So you see what we found over the last few years is that the crab is actually more important to the productivity of the Delaware Bay ecosystem than it is to birds. It's just that it's not being recognized by the people who should be protecting it. See, because those, those eggs and those young are going into forage fish, which are going into stripers, to flounder, to wheat fish. So uh, the crab is a species, one of those species that, that underpins an entire ecosystem. So a good example of how this wrecked the fishery system in Delaware Bay is wheat fish. A weak fish are were the iconic uh, sport fish of Delaware Bay. Fortescue on the bay was once called the weak fish capital of the world. It was supporting uh, marinas, uh, restaurants, like all the fishermen, the, the recreational fishers that came in to, to, 
to uh, fish for weak fish, we're supporting all these local uh, communities. And see, uh, this is the poundage of weak fish taken from New Jersey and Delaware uh, over the period of 1998 to the present, or this is just the 2016. But you can see the, the, the weak fish collapsed almost the same way that horseshoe crabs did. So the horseshoe crabs were uh, creating a fishery that was supporting all these local communities and when the fisheries agency allowed the horseshoe crab to be over harvested, they destroyed the fisheries that they're supposed to be managing. But see, they still don't recognize this because they just refuse to take care of the, these species that are the basis of a productive ecosystem. And see, this is happening all along the East Coast. Like there are horseshoe the Delaware Bay is the largest horseshoe crab population in the world. It's the biggest in the U.S. But horseshoe crabs occur in almost every estuary along the East Coast from New Hampshire to Florida. And in each place, like uh, we are starting a project now to assess the po populations of horseshoe crabs in other places. And what we're finding is that most of them are being harvested in the same way that Delaware Bay is, except they're just harvesting down to, to the nub so that you can't harvest anymore. There's too few to harvest. So the numbers are very sparse and there's only one place in the East Coast where horseshoe crabs have gotten to a level where eggs are on the surface and that's in South Carolina. And that's why, you know, if you wanna read about how the companies are destroying that population. You can read that article in the South Carolina newspaper, The State, because that, that tells you there, it's not bait, that the bait fishermen that are killing crabs, it's the bleeding company. So that brings me to the final part of this talk, which is about the Horseshoe Crab Recovery Coalition. So, we started an organization to try to deal with this. And uh, right now we have over 30 uh, groups that are part of the coalition. We just had two new groups uh, join this week to uh, aquariums. Uh, it includes National Audubon, it includes Na uh, National Wildlife Federation, Defenders for Wildlife, uh, the American Bird Conservancy, and then local groups like the Wing Coat uh, Bird Club all along the East Coast. So what we're trying to do is build up a, a network of uh, conservation-minded citizens to help uh, change this circumstance. Because see, the thing is, it doesn't help anyone to keep a population at a low level. Like when you have a, a a crab population at full capacity, it's called carrying capacity, then you have uh, every year, you're creating many more new uh, mature crabs than you would if the population was only a third. You see what I'm saying? That the most productive populations are when they're at full carrying capacity. So it makes no sense to keep the population at one third of its size. It doesn't make any sense from a commercial fishing perspective, from recreational fishing, or from uh, a bird conservationist. It, this is just silly uh, conservation in the United States. This is the way it, it's going right now because industries are controlling most of natural resource agencies. So the goals of this coalition is to stop the wasteful killing. So we don't wanna stop bleeding because that has an important influence on human health. But there is a, a, a synthetic that can replace the LAL that's coming from horseshoe crab blood. So we're gonna to try to stop the wasteful killing. We're gonna, we're, uh, we are in the process of trying to, uh, to have companies adopt the synthetic 
it's called RFC. And then we're trying to build this uh, coalition of, of people that are, are not just birders. So we, the groups are fishers. Uh, we, Eli Lilly is part of the coalition. Uh, we have fishermen groups on the coalition. So we're trying to build a broad based coalition to try to, uh, to turn this situation around. So thank you. Wow, uh, that was incredible. It kind of just blew my mind there. Um, so I grew up fishing, like I said, in Fortescue and that whole area. And as I grew up, the, the weak fish stopped showing up. And I, my dad had his reasons as a fisherman, but th you have scientific proof of why this is happening. And I, I'm just mind blown because I've always wondered what happened to the weak fish. Uh, we used to go out on party boats all the time and go fishing. And that just stopped as I, as I grew up. And I was always wondering why, but mind blown right yeah. there. Um, you can see the, Kevin, you can see the insanity of this because, you know, what, what the industry, the fishing industry and the bleeding industry people will say is, you know, this is about jobs. But what, you, there, maybe there was 30 jobs maybe for all of this fishery. It was, uh, but think of all the jobs that were lost because of the, the dead marinas and dead restaurants and all, you yeah. know, it was thousands of jobs lost. Yeah, <laughs> I, saw the, that. It, it, I saw that firsthand down there. There used to be countless places that I went out to eat with my grandmother. I think maybe one of those original places is still open and they're closing several more closed during COVID. So yeah, the Delaware Bay used to be a hop in place with the restaurants and activities and uh, it was kind of like a short town, but nowadays it's, it's almost like a ghost town if you've been down there. Um, so yeah, I didn't even think about all of that. That all came from horseshoe crabs. And that blows my mind. That, but that is how simple ecology, not simple, but that's how simple ecology can be in certain, certain situations. You take one thing away or change one thing, it can all come crashing down and there's effects for the environment and, and for us you know, economically and everything like that. Wow, well, my mind's blown. Thank you for that presentation, Dr. Niles. That was incredible. Um, I did have one question, and I'm sure some other people here do too. Uh, but my question is, so down in Fortescue, they closed the beaches off um, for almost a month during during this season. And about, I think it's June, they close off the beaches for the horseshoe crabs to lay their eggs and the birds to come. So no one's allowed to use that part of the beach. Does this happen anywhere else? Is there also efforts like that elsewhere? Uh, there isn't, but let me explain that a little further because uh, we've determined through our work that uh, one of the main threats to the birds before the collapse of the horseshoe crabs was disturbance. More and more people were coming down and, you know, particularly photographers, they would just, you know, try to get as close as they could and birds were being flushed around. So we started this stewardship effort where we're not stopping people, we're, we're, we're uh, like, a lot of the places where birds occur are accessed by dead end roads and like they just end at the beach. So we put up barriers so that people can't go from, uh, you know, at the road end onto the beaches. And uh, see the benefit of that is that birds acclimate to that. So that uh, once you stop people from roaming all over the place, then the birds come right up to the fences so that you could still get good pictures, still have a close experience, but you're not disturbing the birds. So that project, we do that now in uh, all of the beaches that are important to the birds that have accessibility, but we've also added stewards. So there's volunteer stewards, uh, people like yourself who are uh, you know, there to explain to people why it's being done and to um, you know, point out uh, what's of value to the people that are coming. Uh, there is nothing like this in other places. We're, we're tr actually trying to expand it to Delaware, but they're, they're reluctant to, to have any regulation of their beaches. That's kind of disappointing because they do a nice job at Fortescue. Um, the kids come in and the kids make the nice like 
the nice pictures that they laminate and they put up around explaining why they closed the beach for a month. Um, I think that's through the partnership for the Delaware Estuary. Um, do you work with them often? Mm -hmm. Yep, regularly. Awesome. Well, thanks for answering my question. I think we have a couple more questions here. Let me uh, let me go back through. Uh, the first question from uh, our president, Dr. Uh, Lee Altadonna. How can Audubon chapters join the Horseshoe Crab Re uh, Recovery Coalition? How do I know he was going to ask this? Uh, if you, so go to the website, it's hscrabrecovery.org. And uh, in the top bar, there's take action. And then it tells you how to join. And there's a video there that actually shows you how to um, join. It's, it's simple. It's, it's really uh, sending your logo for your organization and taking part. We have four different four different groups, subgroups. Uh, there's one that's many groups. It's, uh, we have a state group in New York, Connecticut, Massachusetts, and then there's groups in South Carolina and Georgia, uh, North Carolina. So that's one part of it. Uh, we have a working group on the synthetic RSV that includes a lot of the medical companies, uh, pharmaceutical, company reps, and but a lot of conservationists as well. Uh, and then we have a, another group that is trying to in, uh, start this year, and I should speak to this, uh, we're, this year we're trying to start a coastwide survey of horseshoe crabs. So we're developing a mapping uh, of a preliminary mapping that projects where horseshoe horseshoe crabs should be according to their the habitat and wave characteristics and then uh, the various groups in the uh, coast are going to field volunteers to just go out and see if the crabs are there and take the temperature of the water and then next year we're going to implement an, a more serious survey of spawning numbers and in some places even egg count. So anyway, that's that's the the other group, and then we have a a, a fourth group that's a, a sort of a agency. We're trying to uh, influence the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission to change their rule. So that's the, the third group, fourth group. So just go to the website, uh, take action, and then it's uh, there's a video there that explains how to join. And I can, if you write to me, I can help if there's any issue. Awesome. So I put that, that website in the chat for everybody if you're interested. And um, yeah, I'm sure we can send that out if you just email either Lee or myself or anyone in Wincote. Um, we'll send that link over to you. Um, and I'll, it sounds like we have something to talk about in our next uh, board meeting. So that'll be exciting. Uh, next question here. Do. do, do. Uh, Sherry says, thanks for the presentation. I spent a lot of time in my childhood with my grandfather at Brigantine, now Forsyth, turning the horseshoe crabs off their backs so the gulls didn't eat them in the 70s and 80s. Thanks for sharing. And then we have uh, Bindi says, or asks, what groups manage the fishing regulations, state by state or nationally? Reminds me of Alaska's regulation of salmon fishing. Um, the uh, see each state uh, manages its own fishery, and uh, so the you know conservation of fish really varies depending on which state you're in. It's being coordinated by the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, which is a commission that was created by the. Magnuson Stevens Act. Uh, and so they basically, the, the commission uh, assesses population, recommends quotas for killing, and then those quotas are distributed to each of the states, and then the states implement them. Uh, I think the reference to the Atlantic Coast 
their Pacific Coast is is apt because uh, you know my sons live in in uh, California, so I have some familiarity with the fishing out there, and uh, there the the um, stocks are managed much better. I mean, there's uh, abundant recreational fishing, and the commercial fishing is controlled uh, to to uh, benefit mostly the people who live in the community. So whatever that is, in Alaska, it's mostly fishing communities, but uh, in say San Francisco Bay, it's uh, most of the commercial product is going to restaurants. So it's building up sort of local industry. The uh, Atlantic States is industry. I mean, it's, you know, there was a big battle with the omega-3 and cat food companies that were taking all in Manhattan. And, you know, it took years to, to have them recognize that fish were eating the Manhattan too. Uh, so I, I, the, the Atlantic state, the Atlantic coast fisheries are not well managed. And it's not always the case The Pacific coast and Gulf coast are much better managed. When will we learn? Um... Uh, our next question comes from Bonnie. She says, would horseshoe crabs be considered keystone species in the Delaware Bay? That's a very good question. That's exactly what they are. They're a, a keystone. So the idea is you pull out, keystone is the, you know, the one stone that supports all the others. Uh, that's what's happening here. You pull it out and everything falls apart. Exactly right. And the next question, we got a, a thank you for your presentation, Dr. Niles. How can we help? And I think you kind of explained that with uh, going to the website, but uh, do you have another answer there, Dr. Niles? Yes, we have a, a bunch of uh, several volunteer projects that anyone is welcome to join. So uh, we have the stewards. The, the uh, stewards that manage each of the beaches. Uh, we have uh, volunteers that take part in our banding and our reciting of shorebirds. Uh, there's a volunteer program for overturning crabs. So you walk along the beach and turn over crabs that have been turned over by waves or that are impinged in derelict bulkheads and that kind of thing. Um, so we, there are a, a number of, of uh, volunteer activities, and if anyone's interested, then they can email me and I can connect them with the volunteer organization. Awesome. Um, next question from Bonnie. She says, seems that with the horseshoe crab decline, there will be more incentive for use of the synthetic crab blood for medical use. Perhaps then the crab population will start to rebound? I see, I think that's a really important question because see, a lot of the problem with the, the bleeding companies is that they, uh, even though they're multinational corporations, the agencies are treating them like they're individual fishermen, which means that they get the protection. Like an individual fisher doesn't have to disclose the location of their catch or the number of, of the animal that they're taking if there's less than three, three or less fishermen. It's called the rule of three. And the idea is that, you know, if I'm fishing for uh, something and I can figure out some other fisher's location, then I could go and take his fit or the fish that he's trying to catch. So it was meant to try to protect individual fishermen. But what the, these companies are doing is using it to hide all their data. So these people are making $600 million. They're uh, killing hundreds of thousands of crabs a year uh, and nobody can see the data. So I, I'm on one of the committees of the ASMFC that helps determine the quota of crabs that are gonna die. And um, 
and we're not allowed to see the data from the the fishing from the bleeding company. So it's uh, see, I think uh, I have to be careful how I say this because it's a very litigious group. Um, they have effectively captured the regulatory system so that they're essentially unregulated. And uh, they're, uh, even though they're making gobs of money, they're not putting anything into the management of the fishery. So they're not paying for surveys, they're not paying for habitat uh, creation, you know, nothing. They're just taking animals and making money and all the damage is being suffered by all these communities. I think that, uh, and, and they're also resisting the implementation of the, the uh, synthetic RFC. The European pharmacopoeia has already adopted the, the RFC and the US pharmacopoeia had indicated that they were going to, and all of a sudden they changed their mind. And, uh, and our investigations suggest that it was because of one company that changed their mind. Charles River, which is the subject of that article that I want you to read because it just tells you everything about the industry. So in other words, the synthetic is being entangled in usual US, uh, I, I wanna say corruption, but I'm, I'm just gonna say craziness. Ah, no, oh, that's frustrating. Um, could you, uh, where, where's that um, article that you're talking about? I'm sure everyone wants to read that, uh, especially now. Is that on your website so as well? Uh, well, it's, it's in the paper, The State, in South Carolina. And uh, if you just put in The State, Horseshoe Crab, the article will come up. It was just two weeks ago. The State. Oh, Crap. Let's see if I can find it here for everybody. State newspaper. Oh, shit. Crap. All right. I'll keep looking that up as uh, we answer. We had a couple more questions here, and I'll try to find that article. If anyone else can find that article, please put that in the chat for me here. Um, uh, it's by uh, Kira Eisner, C H I. A-R-A, Kira Eisner. All right, I think someone will be able to find that and put it in the chat for us. I'll get to the next question here. The, the red knot was put on the endangered species list. Has this helped? Yes, it, it, it created the floor. So uh, without that, the, the, the horseshoe crabs of Delaware Bay would be in the same place as they are in all the other locations along the Atlantic coast. It was the listing of the red knot that stopped it from going down any further. Uh, the listing is also helping to create protection in all of the other places where the birds are going. And uh, like the red knot's not a, a uh, keystone species, it's, it's what is called a flagship species where that one species is providing protection for a lot of other and so, uh, you know, states and agencies are using it that way. So for example, the refuges are doing work on protecting red knots because it's a federally enlisted species. So yes, it was a, a, a big thing that the red knot was listed. Yeah, it just goes to show anything in this field is, I mean, you can't care about it until you know about it. So it's great work that you were doing. Um, do, 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 going through the questions here. We want someone wants Lee to send it out in the next newsletter, which I think we can do. Um, and then Janet asks, isn't there a synthetic blood substitute? But I think we covered that. Uh, Janet, if you want more information on that, just type up another question. But I think we covered that. Um, Carl, I think this is our guest from Scotland. Someone joined us from Scotland tonight. Um, I didn't know if you were aware of that. Um, so he said, Really fascinating talk. We are not separate to nature. 
but very much part of it. Nature has never been in balance through natural process, but include humans and exploitation in that situation, it can become damaging. It is all about understanding and science is key. This work is amazing and mirrors many situations with wildlife the world over, including here in Scotland. Thank, thank you. you for that. Yeah. Yep, thank you. But I see Carl there too, he's on the screen. Hey Carl, thanks for joining us, that's incredible. Um, and then we had Rosemary asking um, for your email address. Um, Dr. Niles, is it okay if I share your email address in the chat? Yes. Okay, everyone heard me there? All right, I'll, I'll get his email in the chat before we close out. Um, Bonnie said, thank you so much for this informative program. And then two people have put the chat in the chat, they put the link for that article. So if you'd like to read that article, the link is in the chat now. Thank you um, for getting that in there, everybody. And then um, one last question while I find, get your email address. Um, Elizabeth Porter asked, is the New Jersey research coordinated with research in Delaware? Yes, um, to some extent, you know, there's the state differences, uh, but uh, like our surveillance of knots and crabs is done day wide. So, you know, every year, like it's another volunteer opportunity. We have people that uh, go out to the beaches and uh, look for the flags and record the the uh, alphanumeric codes, and and in you know in a in a regular way, so that we can use the data to estimate population. That's being done day wide. The count of horseshoe crab uh, spawning is done day wide. Um, trapping uh, Delaware has a team trapping shorebirds, just like uh, our team in in New Jersey. So yeah, there's. Uh, and we interact with them regularly. So it's, it's more or less coordinated. But, you know, two states, Delaware is a state that is, you know, I used to work in Southern states. It's, it's more like Southern states, whereas New Jersey is more like Northern states. So it's a very different perspective on conservation. Wow. So, well, my, my mind's racing. I think I have a million more questions, but uh, we are at uh, a little past time here. Um, Lee, did you have any final remarks or should I close this out? No, um, I think you can close it out, but you know, thank you to Dr. Niles and thanks to everyone that uh, tuned in, especially the folks we had, you, know, you said Scotland. I think we had Alberta, Canada. Um, we okay. had somebody from Alaska and from Vermont as well. So, Oh. We had a lot of Wincote members or folks from the region that they're friends and uh, welcome them. I hope they got a lot out of this. And uh, we're going to try to find out how we can get more of our uh, sister chapters involved with the uh, coalition. Good. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Absolutely. Thanks, Lee. And uh, I don't see any more questions here, but like we said, um, well, I put his email in the chat. So, uh, well, don't be, uh, don't overburden him, but his uh, email is there in the chat for your questions. Please be respectful. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Niles. This was probably one of our more provocative uh, programs that we've had, and it's going to cause a lot of these people to take action. Um, so I really appreciate your time. Uh, thank you all for joining us uh, this Friday evening. It was a, For me, it was a great way to spend Friday. I learned a lot. I hope you all did, too. Um, check out our website, uh, Wincote Audubon. Our next program is coming up in April. So, like I said, thanks for joining us uh, from us at Wincote Audubon Society. We appreciate you. And thank you again, Dr. Niles. Thank you. It's a pleasure talking to you. Thank you.